Welcome, everybody. Um, this is the very first event in the RSE Investigates Conservation Program. I'm Mary Bounds, a retired professor of developmental biology and now on the boards of the National Museums of Scotland and the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland and a recent program convener for the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Besides yourself, we have online several colleagues from the RSE who will ensure that everything runs smoothly, including Talia West and Kate Kennedy, who are responsible for the outreach and engagement programs at the RSE, and in particular this series. And of course, Dr. Helen Taylor from RZSS, who will be letting you know about her work in a few minutes. The Royal Society of Edinburgh is Scotland's national academy with a broad spread of expertise in the sciences, arts and humanities, education, business and much more. Part of the role of RSC is to encourage and enable debate and discussion on topical, sometimes controversial and challenging issues. When I was programme convener for a few years, I proposed this series on conservation in its broadest sense to cover not just conservation of species, habitats and areas of land and sea, but also our culture and heritage. Such things are complex, often controversial, and there is no correct answer. As such, they're challenging and people have different views based on their expertise and experiences. The appearance of the program was significantly delayed due to the pandemic and the many issues it caused for everyone. However, we're now ready, and I'm very happy that you are here to share some of this research and its outcomes. In this first event in the series, we'll share information about some of the less obvious things that need conserving. Everything requires research and investigation and deciding what to conserve how to conserve it and how it fits into the bigger picture is absolutely crucial. Often little things get ignored in conservation, but they're just as crucial to ecosystems as the larger, more obvious species like wildcats or beavers. Many of Scotland's wild places have been used for purposes that have caused damage and no longer show the diversity of species needed to be sustainable as habitats and many species are becoming extinct as a result. RZSS is committed to reversing the decline of species and endangered pine hoverflies, rare moths and solitary mining bees are among those being cared for and helped in various ways. They're crucial to the Cairngorms, the area which the Highland Wildlife Park is part of, and you will hear more about the length staff volunteer and partners go to to change the fate of these tiny creatures for the benefit of all of us. You may have ideas as the talk progresses and you can use your Q&A button to send in questions during the presentation and at the end we will put a selection of these questions representing a variety of ideas to Helen. If you need subtitles you can use the Otter AI function at the top of the Zoom screen. And this event is being recorded and it will be available to view on the RSE's YouTube eventually. Now, Dr. Helen Taylor is currently the Conservation Programme Manager at the Royal Society of Scotland. She began this in 2019 on her return from eight years of conservation work in New Zealand and she's an expert on translocation management and conservation genetics. As a PhD student, she mostly conducted research on inbreeding in threatened bird species and its effect on fertility. In her current role, she has managed the beaver population in Napdale, Argyll, as part of the Scottish Beavers Project, and is responsible for the society's breeding and reintroduction programs the four native invertebrate species. Helen is a passionate, award-winning science communi communicator 
having been awarded the Royal Society of Adam, uh, Royal Society of New Zealand Medal for Science Communication. She's never happier than when she's talking about conservation research, conducting that research, or preferably both. And I can certainly confirm this is true. I've enjoyed many extremely illuminating conversations with Helen at the RZSS. So without further ado, I will pass on to Helen. Thanks, Mary. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm just going to share my screen here so that you can see my presentation. Uh, so that should be up there now. Um, so, yes, my name is Dr. Helen Taylor, and I am the Conservation Programme Manager at the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. And I'm really glad to be here today as part of this special seminar series that the Royal Society of Edinburgh has organised. Just a few words about um, RZSS before we get started, because uh, when I tell people that I work for RZSS, they kind of sometimes look at me a little bit blankly until I explain that we are a conservation charity that runs Edinburgh Zoo and Highland Wildlife Park, and they've usually heard of one or both of those zoos. So yes, we, we are a wildlife conservation charity. We do run two zoos, and we also have a conservation department who I work for um, that looks after conservation projects or is part of conservation projects um, on well, 23 different projects, both here in Scotland and overseas. Um, we also have the only uh, zoo-based conservation genetics lab in the UK, our Wild Genes Lab here at Edinburgh Zoo, where I'm sitting today. Um, and we run big reintroduction projects. We, um, as Mary said, we're part of the Beavers to Scotland project, the first successful reintroduction of a mammal uh, anywhere in Britain. We also support large-scale conservation projects in places like Brazil, and Uganda, and we have um, a very large high profile project that we're leading on to save Scotland's wildcats. I'm not going to be talking about any of that today, we're talking about completely different things. But just to give you um, an idea of the sort of scope of our conservation work and in terms of the kinds of species that we work with and the geographical scope of those species, you can see it's it's pretty broad. Um, so we're working in, in many um, places around the world with many different kinds of species, from invertebrates all the way up to giant anteaters, giant armadillos, amphibians, antelopes, elephants, um, and a lot of different things in between. Uh, but today we're going to be focusing in on some of the work that we do in Scotland and in particular, as Mary has intimated, the work that we do with threatened invertebrates um, here in Scotland. So I'm a little bit obsessed with invertebrates at this point. Uh, my background is that I worked mainly in birds. And then, uh, as I've just said, I worked with the beaver project. But in recent years, I've become increasingly obsessive about our work with invertebrates. And I want to explain why that is and why I think they're important and why I think you should think they're important too. So invertebrates um, are very important in terms of our ecosystems and keeping our ecosystems running and healthy. They're often doing really, really important jobs with in ecosystems, anything from pollination, and, and that can be, you know, wild plants, but they're also really important pollinators of crop plants as well. So if you like chocolate, if you like coffee, you want to be caring about invertebrates because they pollinate the plants that produce those foods um, and much more besides. They also often act to break down and recycle waste in the environment, and they're always part of food chains, either as, uh, as predators and prey. Um, so they're kind of the glue that's holding ecosystems together. And unfortunately, uh, given that, they are in trouble. So we know that um, within invertebrates, 40% of insects are at risk of extinction globally. Um, there are definitely big population crashes going on uh, in insects and other invertebrates around the world for various reasons. Um, but they are one of the most numerous groups in terms of species known to science. So 77% of all species known to science are invertebrates. So in spite of the fact that they're super important, and that they're in trouble and that there are loads of them, they are frequently ignored in conservation efforts. So for example, in terms of reintroduction projects, so some of the work that we do at RZSS and lots of other people do as well, only 13% of recorded reintroduction projects um, focus on invertebrates. So they're important, they're in trouble, and they're being frequently overlooked in conservation efforts. And that's something that we're aiming to help change um, with our work here at RZSS. And the invertebrate work that we do here had pretty humble beginnings. So this is where we started uh, our conservation breeding program for pine hoverflies at Highland Wildlife Park. And as you can see, it is very much a shed. 
there's a very old shed that's sort of falling apart a little bit. And it's really only thanks to the incredible work of the keepers who were tasked with working with this species just before I started at RZSS that this project got off the ground at all. So working in quite difficult, very basic circumstances. And from this tiny beginning, we've managed to grow our invertebrate breeding program so that currently um, at Highland Wildlife Park, our facilities look like this. So we do have another shed, but it's a much bigger shed and a much more high tech specced up shed. And we also have another purpose built facility that is crucially not a shed. Um, and this is the way our facilities will be going from now on. So these are fully climate controlled, um, much more difficult for other insects to get inside, um, much more difficult for our invertebrates that we're looking at to escape from and much better designed for, for the work we want to do. When I started in 2019, the team was essentially just me, uh, but the team has now grown and I have two dedicated staff up at Highland Wildlife Park. So this is Adam and Carl, you can see here, um, who work uh, full time on our invertebrate um, conservation projects. And just to give you a glimpse inside one of the facilities, uh, this is the inside the big shed, inside our pine hoverfly facility is what it looks like when it's all set up for adult breeding season, which is what's happening right now. Um, just to give you an idea of the scope um, of, of the kind of the work that we're doing. So what I'm going to do today is just take you through some of our work. Um, I can't go through every single invertebrate project we do, um, but I'm going to go through a few of them just to give you an idea of the kind of work that we're doing and where we are, what stage we're at with those different pieces of work. Um, and then obviously, if you want to ask me more about any of those or any of our other pieces of work that you might have heard about, you're more than welcome to do so at the end. So I'm gonna kick off with Pine Hoverfly, which is potentially our, um, one of our most high profile projects at the moment. And it really is, at the, it's currently one of our biggest success stories in terms of conservation reintroductions, probably outside of our work with beavers. So pine hoverfly is a species that you may not have heard before, and that's totally fine. Most people very, most people have never heard of this species. Even fewer have ever seen one uh, in the wild. Um, because they are critically endangered, they're extremely rare, and I'll explain why in a second. But just to introduce you to this animal, it really is quite a beautiful fly, really, when you get to see it up close. And we've got a male and a female here. And the main differences between the male and the female is that the male doesn't have a gap between his eyes and the female does. That's kind of hard to tell when you're, when you're just looking at them very quickly. So the biggest difference really that's more obvious is that the male has a lot more orange on his abdomen than the female does. And that's how we typically tell them apart if we're just having a quick glimpse. This is one of the UK's rarest invertebrates. Um, so they're listed as critically endangered on the UK red list. And pre-1980, um, back in the day, they were found uh, in various sites throughout the Cairngorms National Park area. They were first discovered in Deeside back in the late 1800s. There was uh, an entomologist staying in a, in a hotel near Mar Lodge Estate, and he heard a very annoying buzzing noise against his hotel window, and he swatted the insect, and it fell to the, fell to the windowsill, and he looked at it and was like, oh, haven't seen one of those before, and discovered that it was something that had never been seen in Britain before, which was a pine hoverfly. So he did what all good museum people do, took it back to the museum, pinned it, and um, recorded it as the first wild type specimen. Um, so yes, this is a species that's always kind of been restricted to the Cairngorms area within Britain. It's also found throughout Europe. Um, most places it's found, it's thought to be declining, uh, but it really is in its most critical condition here in Britain. And Post-1980, uh, when the Malak Society, um, who are a group of specialists who work on flies in particular, um, were looking for this species, they found that its range had really declined and it was just being found in Speyside. And its current distribution is effectively just one location uh, in the Cairngorms National Park, one small forest plantation block um, where you can find pine hoverfly today. Um, obviously, that's not a great situation to be in because if anything happens to that forest block, then that pine hoverfly extinct from Scotland. So not, not great uh, in terms of what's going on. And the main threats to the species, the reason the range has contracted so much is habitat loss. And I'll explain a little bit about what pine hoverflies need in a minute. So yeah, in terms of pine hoverflies, who are they and what do they do? Um, the adults are really important as uh, pollinators. So we know that they uh, feed on flowering trees like rowan. And when they're moving between those trees, they're, they're pollinating them like a lot of insects do. 
The larval stage acts as waste recyclers in the forest. So that's another important function that they're fulfilling. And in terms of the kind of forest, the habitat that I was mentioning that they need, what they want is mature old growth pine forests. So big old granny Caledonian pines, but it can't just be pines. They also need a heart rot fungus that I'm not gonna try to pronounce here. Um, and that's a, that's a fungus that gets into the pine trees and causes these rot holes um, that the females need to lay their eggs in. So that's really important function. And then they also need species like rowan, lots and lots of rowan, because that's what the adult flies are gonna feed on in order to reproduce and get through the next generation. This is a species with an annual life cycle, much like a lot of invertebrates have. Um, and so at this time of year, what you have is adult flies going around the forest and they are looking for these rot holes in stumps and branches that have died, filled up with rainwater. And it's created this kind of sawdust mulch um, that the larvae will grow and feed in. So the females are flying around the forest looking for these holes to lay their eggs in. This is the species that spends the majority of its life, uh, about nine months of the year, as a larva. And so they'll grow up in these rot holes as larva, feeding on uh, bacteria and microbes in the rainwater, um, laying down fat to get bigger and bigger until around sort of April, May time when they're ready to pupate. And, you know, we work with a few species that pupate, and it's worth mentioning how, what a crazy process that is, because what you've got there is an animal breaking down its entire body and then into a, into a goo inside this pupil case and then rebuilding it as a completely different body, which when you think about it is absolutely bananas compared to how we grow and just stay the same the entire time. So the, the genetic cascade involved in that, all the different things that have to happen to make that successful, it's absolutely insane that so many insects and other invertebrates are doing it all the time. Um, so they go through pupation, that takes around sort of uh, four weeks or so, and then they emerge as an adult fly. And then the male and female flies have to find each other and mate and reproduce, and the whole thing starts again. And the adult flies only live for about four to six weeks. So the bit that's the most visible to us is actually one of the shortest life stages that this animal has. And just to touch on the larva, um, I really like this picture because it shows what a cute species this is as a larva. Now, some people will call pine hoverfly larvae rat-tailed maggots, but I actually think that's massively unfair because um, it makes them sound really gross. And look at that face. This isn't a gross animal. This is a beautiful animal. And you can see it's got here this very characteristic mustache. And the mustache is made of these tiny wee hooks that the animal uses to sift microbes and bacteria out of the rainwater mulch that it's feeding in. Um, it also looks like, the reason it looks like it's got a cute little face is because it looks like it's got these two little eyes, but those are actually spiracles, which are uh, breathing tubes. So it, it can breathe through those spiracles and then it also has what they call the tail, but that's actually another breathing tube and it acts as a kind of snorkel that can go up to the top of the, the rot hole and then be retracted right back down when they need to as well. So it's a pretty amazing wee beastie and we like to think of them as kind of the mustachio gentlemen of the hoverfly world rather than rat-tailed maggots. And they have some pretty amazing properties. So this is a species that can freeze thaw, which when you think about it, if you're living in forests in the Cairngorms um, that are regularly going to freeze and have snow and really cold temperatures, that's quite a useful adaptation. So we know this uh, from, our, from our breeding population that um, they can freeze completely and then thaw out and then go through to pupation. And the first time this happened in our breeding population, we were all absolutely terrified. Um, and this is an example of a, of a larval microcosm that's been, that's been frozen here. Um, and then they all thawed out, they all pupated as normal, and that was just a normal season for them. Um, so it's an amazing adaptation. We don't actually know how they do it. Lots of animals are cold tolerant like this. It could be that they're producing their own antifreeze. It could be that they're going into a torpor, um, but it's a super important adaptation for life um, up in the Caledonian woods. And like I said, one of the main issues for this species is habitat loss. So there is not a lot of mature growth, complex pine forest around in Scotland at the moment. And that's because the way we use land has changed, forestry management practices have changed. And so a lot of that habitat um, that's so important for pine hoverflies have been lost, which is why we think their range has become so restricted. So we work in partnership on this project, and that's true for the vast majority of the projects that RZSS works on. It's almost never just us alone. We're always working in partnership with other organisations. And in this case, we work as part of the Rare Invertebrates in the Cairngorms project, which features all the partners you can see on the slide here, as well as uh, alongside Forestry and Land Scotland. 
And what the other partners in this project have been doing is going out into the wild, into forests that could be suitable for pine hoverfly releases in future and creating um, habitat. So what they're doing is making artificial rot holes for females to lay their eggs in. So if a tree needs to be felled or a branch is coming down anyway, they will use a chainsaw to uh, to make a hole in that stump or that, or that branch. And then that fills up naturally with rainwater and it creates this artificial rot hole environment that the females can lay their eggs in. And so they've been doing huge amounts of habitat creation in various potentially suitable sites in the Cairngorms. But pine hoverflies can't disperse very far. So they're not going to be able to get from the one place they are left into these, these sites that are being created to be suitable. So what you really need is more flies. And that's where we come in with our pine hoverfly breeding program. So the idea being that we breed pine hoverflies um, at our facility at Highland Wildlife Park um, so that they can be released into suitable sites and hopefully create new populations, getting more pine hoverflies into more places and securing them for future. And in order to do that, um, we have to recreate the, all the things that the different life stages of the species need um, in our facility. So, for example, I said that the larval stage needs to grow in a pine rot hole full of sawdust mulch, eating bacteria and microbes. Well, we create that at Highland Wildlife Park using effectively a large jam jar filled up with pine sawdust and rainwater um, that makes this bacterial soup for the larvae to live in. When it's time to pupate, there's a moss plug at the top of that jar that the larva can crawl up into and start pupation. And when that's happening, we take the moss plug out of the top of the jar and put it into an empty hummus pot. So you can see some of the materials we're using, jam jars, hummus pots. It's quite, quite low tech, but it does require a lot of time and attention. Once the animal pupates and emerges as an adult, they go into specially designed flight cages that are kitted out with all the kind of flowering plants that they need and also some supplemental honey water. And we also put laying pots into those cages so that the females can lay eggs um, in the sawdust that's going to attract them to do that uh, whenever they want. And then we then collect those pots, count up the larvae that have been laid in them and start the whole thing again. So this is a project we've been working on for a while now. We were first asked to breed pine hoverfly uh, by the pine hoverfly steering group back in 2015. Um, it took us a while to, to get the breeding cycle working um, in our facility because it's, it's quite a hard species to do. Um, and it was, wasn't until 2019 that we took them through a breeding cycle for the first time. After that, we kind of went from strength to strength. So we started with 25 larvae that have been brought in from the wild population. In that first cycle, we only bred 16 larvae, which doesn't sound great, but just getting them through the cycle at all was a massive achievement. Then by 2020, we produced 170 larvae. And in 2021, from those 170 larvae, we produced 8,000 larvae, which is quite a lot of larvae. And this is what that looks like when they're all in their jars inside the facility. So each jar will have about 20 larvae in, and you can just see it's, it's tons of larvae, it's tons of jars. And so at this point, obviously, we cannot raise all of these animals through to adulthood, and it's time to actually do some releases and get these guys back out into the wild, which was always the plan. So we have these release sites that have been specially selected um, as, as suitable. And these are release sites that are managed for conservation by the RSPB and by FLS in the case of Glenmore. Uh, so we're looking at Abernethy Forest and Glenmore Forest, which are both part of the Kangorbs Connect program as well. Um, and the idea is that eventually these sites are going to become joined up and that will be better for pine hoverflies to be able to spread between them as well, probably with a bit of a helping hand. And so in October 2021 and March 2022, uh, we released over 6,000 larvae across these three sites um, as part of a major reintroduction program to try and establish new populations of pine hoverflies in these sites. And in June 2021, we had some really exciting news where at one of our release sites, an adult pine hoverfly was sighted. And this was the first time an adult pine hoverfly had been seen in the wild for about eight years. They're really, really hard to see. And we knew it must be one of ours because there were no pine hoverflies in these sites before. So that was massive because it meant that at least some of the larvae that we put out had got through pupation and emerged as adults. Obviously, just having adults isn't enough. They need to find each other and breed and reproduce. And so we conducted larval surveys in September last year um, to have a look and see if we could find any new larvae that had been produced by our guys. And we did. We found proof of, of, of released animals breeding in the wild. So they've gone through a whole breeding cycle in the wild and produced larvae, which is a fantastic first step towards success. 
But we're not done with this project yet. Reintroductions are a long-term commitment and one round of successful breeding in the wild is not enough. So we are still now consistently breeding about 8,000 larvae per year at Highland Wildlife Park. You can see Adam and Carl here doing some more releases. So in October last year and March this year, we released another 6,000 larvae across those three release sites. Uh, we're currently in the middle of our, our breeding season at Highland Wildlife Park. So it's really busy up there at the moment with a lot of, a lot of activity from our Pine Hover Fly project. And we'll be going out and doing more surveys in September to see how those populations are progressing and whether we need to adapt and change our approach to help those, those populations become more established. So Pine Hover Fly is probably the project we're furthest along with. And off the back of the success of that, we were asked if we would help with another rare invertebrates in the Cairngorm species, which is the dark bordered beauty moth, which you can see here perching on the bottom of a flower. And again, this is a species you may not be familiar with. It's a beautiful moth. These are the male and female. Yet again, some subtle differences between the two. The male has feathered antenna. The female has much more smooth antenna. The males have this darker uh, wing color, the females are lighter, and the patterning on the males is very slightly different where they have a less of an indent in the border around the wing that gives them their name. And again, the reason why you may not be familiar with this species is because it's super rare. It's only known from three sites in the whole of Britain, two of which are up in the Cairngorms National Park. So you start to see Cairngorms National Park is a really important stronghold for a lot of different threatened species. The other population is down randomly in Strensall at Yorkshire, um, and that population is not doing super well. Um, so this is a UK bat priority species. It's listed as a rare species. It's a really important one to, to try and conserve. And this is a species that is completely reliant on aspen. So we know that dark border beauty caterpillars like to feed on aspen suckers, uh, which are the, the small clonal plants that aspen um, trees send out from, a, from their central base point. Um, this is a, an image of some dark border beauty moth eggs, which you may or may not be able to make out here on this twig. They are here. They are tiny. They are like tiny little full stops. I do have dreams of one day working on species that aren't so small that we could just accidentally squish them with our little finger. Um, and again, this is another partnership project. It's another rare invertebrates in the Cairngorms project. This one very much being led uh, for obvious reasons by Butterfly Conservation Scotland with, with the RSPB as well. Um, and so uh, these guys gave us uh, 40 dark border beauty eggs to try breeding with uh, last year. And uh, we took those eggs, which you can see here, um, into our collection in May 2022. Uh, and we managed to hatch out 34 caterpillars from those 40 eggs. And those 34 caterpillars, we managed to get 27 adults reared through in the first season, which is pretty good going for a species that we've not worked with before. And we also brought in an additional six wild males into our adult population to try and boost genetic diversity, because that's something that we think about a lot with our, with our conservation breeding programs. And as a result of that, last year, we managed to produce 497 fertile eggs. So we went from 40 eggs to over 400 eggs, nearly 500 eggs, um, which was a massive, massive success for our, for our first crack at having a go with this species. And so this year, again, we're just moving into the breeding season for Dark Border Beauty. As of today, I can confirm that we've had 366 caterpillars hatch out so far. Adam is spending a lot of time moving these. They are so tiny when they hatch out and he's got to count them and move them around onto fresh aspen very delicately using a paintbrush. So it's all very intricate work. And we will be doing some trial releases of caterpillars and moths this year with butterfly conservation and RSPB. So it's very much watch the space to see how that works because reintroductions are really tricky. They often fail. We find sites that we think the species want. Maybe we haven't got it quite right. Maybe we have. So there'd be a lot of uh, important post-release monitoring going on there to find out if those releases have been successful. And we will, of course, continue breeding the species at Highland Wildlife Park as well. I'm now going to shift down to Edinburgh for uh, one of the other species I'm going to talk about, which is our pond mud snail, which we, uh, the program for which we run here at Edinburgh Zoo. And again, it's another tiny, tiny species. This is a snail that's about the size of your little fingernail. Uh, really hard to see. These, these snails like to live uh, in fresh water, so very peaty fresh water. So it's got to be clean, but it's also very dark peaty water. And um, as their name suggests, they like to burrow down into the mud. So it's not the kind of thing you're just going to see when you're out and about walking and pond dipping and looking in ponds. They're only found at a handful of sites around Britain. They, they were previously much more widespread. And the population that we're most concerned with is in the Pentland Hills at Bayflor Marsh, uh, which is one of the few populations remaining in Scotland. 
again, a similar story. They're, they're threatened by habitat loss, but also pollution from various runoff into the, into the clean ponds that they like to live in. They're listed as vulnerable in Britain, and they are another Scottish biodiversity list species. And again, they're, they're out there in the environment feeding on dead plant material and recycling that waste material back into nutrients that are going back into their ecosystem. So another species that's playing a really important role. In terms of how we work with pond mud snail in our breeding program at Edinburgh Zoo, it's pretty simple. Um, so we have either little pots of uh, water that's been taken from the site in the Pentlands, or we have slightly larger glass tanks uh, that we can house them in as well. So this is one of my staff members, Kasha Ruta, working with our pond mud snails here at Edinburgh Zoo. And Kasha works really closely with our living collections team. because so obviously we have a whole host of animal keepers and vets here that their, their expertise we can draw on for these kind of breeding programs to make sure we're doing everything as best as possible for the animals that are in our care. In terms of bre breeding, pond mud snails are pretty unstoppable um, because they, um, are hermaphrodites so and they can self-fertilize so this means they've got both male and female sexual organs and even if we separated one off and said no we don't want you to breed it could just sit in a body of water by itself and be like well i'm just going to do it myself then and lay a load of eggs that it has self-fertilized so if given the right conditions these guys can breed really rapidly and what you can see here is a, a leaf of pak choy that we uh, is one of the things that we feed this species when it's when it's in the facility and you might not be able to make them out but if i ring them for you what you've got are these little jelly blob masses that have been placed on the pak choy and these are egg rafts and each one will have about 10 to 12 tiny tiny eggs again full stop size pinprick eggs that will be developing into into snails that eventually hatch out and roam around still being tiny for a frightening amount of time so that's how the pond mud snail breeding cycle works and again they don't have different life stages like the pine hoverfly or the dark border beauty moth they just grow up um, from from a tiny tiny snail to a to a slightly bigger snail as they go and in terms of uh, this project was something that started before i joined our zss so these snails were first taken from bayfloor marsh in the pentlands into our facility here at edinburgh zoo in 2017 in 2018, uh, my predecessor in this role actually did a release of pond mud snails into the Red Moss Reserve in, in that's, a, that's a Scottish Wildlife Trust Reserve in the Pentlands near to Bayfloor Marsh. So again, this is about establishing new populations of this species so that it's not just in that one place in the Pentlands, it's spread out into other sites and we're spreading the risk. So 87 snails were released. We then decided to take another 32 founders from Bavelor Marsh into the, the conservation breeding population here to maximize genetic diversity again. And currently we have around 250 snails currently in our breeding facility and we're keeping that breeding population going. But what about those snails that were released back in 2018? What happened with those released populations? Well, we do uh, monthly surveys, which involve myself and, and various team members from our team and from the Living Collections team going out into the Pentlands and basically spending hours and hours sifting through mud looking for tiny, tiny snails, which it, it takes a long time, but when you find them, it's really satisfying. However, we survey the source sites at Bayfloor Marsh to make sure the snails are still there and they're still doing fine. And we also survey the release site. Bayfloor Marsh, we find snails, we know they're there, everything's okay. At the release site, We've never found anything for five years since the snails have been released. So we just sift through mud, we find other species of snails, we don't find pond mud snail. Until April this year, where we were doing a survey and we actually found pond mud snails at the release site, which was massive news because it means that that site is suitable. At least some of the snails that were released there have survived. And we think because we're finding different size classes that they are, are reproducing there as well, which is fantastic. So this is myself with two members of our keeping team, um, Joe and Jade, who came out with us to do the survey that day. And we're all very excited because we found those snails that you can see in the right hand corner there. And part of the work that we're trying to do is also raise the profile of these kind of animals as well, because they are often overlooked. And so we were really excited to be able to get pond mud snails on Winter Watch last season. If you want to catch up with that, Yolo went to Red Moss with me to see the release site and then also came um, to the facility here at Edinburgh Zoo and met one of our keepers, Craig, who you can see there, who uh, manages our pond mud snail breeding program. If you want to catch up with that, you can go on iPlayer and it's in season 11 of Winter Watch and it's episode two, just after a bit about badgers on a webcam. Um, so do check that out if you're interested to know more.
And then just a brief mention before I finish about our latest and perhaps most challenging project from a, from a PR and communications perspective is medicinal leech. Um, so medicinal leech, um, as their name suggests, is a species that was used in medicine really widely, right back from ancient times. There's, there's um, notes from Pliny the Elder about leeches being used in medicine back in back in uh, antiquity, um, right through the medieval time, reaching a peak in the 1800s, early 1900s, for various medicinal practices. And as a result of that harvesting for medicine and then future habitat loss and pollution and worming agents being used in cattle, medicinal leeches populations in, in Britain have completely crashed. And in Scotland, they are only known from one loch on Isla, and that's it. Um, so this is a protected species because they are so rare, they're protected under Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, which means it's illegal to catch them or kill them or keep them unless you've got a license to do so. Um, they're listed internationally as near threatened because across their range in Europe, they're also not doing brilliantly. Um, so this is another partnership project. This is us partnering up with Bug Life, and you can see myself and Adam from our team alongside Craig McAdam and Sally Morris from Bug Life here. And this is part of Bug Life's contribution to the larger Species on the Edge project that's happening in Scotland right now. So this is us at the one remaining site, the lock on Isla, doing a, an initial survey to find these leeches. We found 28 that day, which is the most medicinal leeches that have ever been found in a survey in Scotland. So it doesn't sound like many, but we were very excited. And just to give you a look at these guys, because I know a lot of people are kind of squeamish about leeches, but when you see them actually swimming around, they're pretty beautiful. If you look at all the different colors that are going on there, this is a video I caught of one of the leeches that we found. Um, they're using their, their rear sucker to, as a kind of like fin paddle to, to move around through the water. And they're pretty slick when you actually, when you actually see them moving. Um, so we're right at the beginning of this. We'll be going back out to Isla uh, in August to do another census and to try and harvest um, some leeches to bring back in and start um, breeding at our site at Highland Wildlife Park. But this is very much a watch this space project and we'll, we'll let you guys know how we, how we get on with that. So that's very much a whistle-stop tour of the of the invertebrate conservation work uh, that we've done. We we do have other species that we're working on, like small scabious mining bee at Highland Wildlife Park, that I haven't had time to cover here. Um, but hopefully that's given you an idea of the kind of work we're doing um, on these kind of animals. And I'm sure we've got time for questions. If uh, anybody's got anything they'd like to know, then please do shout up, pop it in the Q&A. And thank you so much for coming and for listening. Thank you. <laughs>